Hey guys, it's Summer Rain from Homestead, Brooklyn, and I'm here at Kingsland Wildflowers, which is an incredible rooftop garden here in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. We're in a very industrial section, but if you just take a look closer at the rooftop, you'll see that there's a lot of native plant species here. I'm seeing a lot of weeding we need to do. Oh God. Don't worry, it's kind of like, you know, when you have a pimple on your face and you're the only one who notices. I'll be talking with Marnie today from Alive Structures, so welcome to this week's episode of Plant One On Me, Field Trip Edition. My name is Marnie Majorelle. I started Alive Structures in 2007. We are a green roof design and installation company, and we also do people's backyards, front yards. Uh, we specialize working with native plants. And where are we today? We are at Kingsland Wildflowers in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, um, in the home of a very industrial part of Greenpoint, Brooklyn. We're surrounded by sewage treatment plants, the metal recycling facility, plastic recycling, um, storage, oh, uh, biofuel refueling station and we're in a movie studio. And we have a 22,000 square foot green roof here planted with wildflowers and native grasses. It's like the beauty and the beast come together all in one place in New York. I'm from New York City and I think that's why I do what I do because I really love New York City, but I also really love nature but I don't want to leave New York City because it's so much fun here and I love, I love it. Um, and I think a lot of people really see the benefits of living in cities, um, being connected to people, not being isolated. And it's also um, a big part of sustainability and our future is in cities. But we can't live without nature. I think we're fooling ourselves that we can mentally or physically live without ecologically active systems all around us, helping us breathe, helping us feel part of nature. So that's part of my motivation for making this swath of wilderness here in Greenpoint. You love the city, but you want to create the community that you want to live in. And part of that is greening up the spaces, whether it's like private spaces or ones that are open to the public, like mm. Kingsland. When you started Alive Structures, did you have the idea of also doing green roofs here, or did that come a little bit later after you started your business? We started really with the idea to do green roofs and to plant native plants. I was really inspired by working for someone named Paul Mankiewicz. He's a soil scientist, and he started the Gaia Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, so. Working for him was a great inspiration. I learned a lot about native plants and green roofs, and I just wanted to start a business that was more in my nature. I'm just more of an entrepreneur. So really doing gardens was more of um, something we didn't plan on or expect, but thank God we did, because if we were just doing green roofs, we probably wouldn't have made it this long, because um, it's not enough of an active industry to have sustained us, at least for the past uh, 10, 11 years. Well, I think like a lot of people love the idea of a green roof. Mm. Um, I love the idea of a green roof, but I know that my, I don't even need a structural engineer to tell me that my roof is not <laughs> gonna hold up a green roof. Let's talk through at least some of the challenges, because yeah. I'm, I'm assuming you probably get a lot more interest in a green roof and then people start to recognize the steps that are needed to take in order to be able to put it up there. So maybe you could elucidate right. that. Yes, we do get a lot of interest in green roofs. And the first step that I tell everyone who is interested is to find out about the structure of their building. Um, you can find out that information from either existing drawings that the owner might have or um, the architect that the owner worked with might have or their existence city records in the Department of Buildings, or if none of that is available, you have to hire a structural engineer to do an analysis of the roof. Uh, the other thing that um, someone who wants a green roof needs to consider is the waterproofing. You need to have a good waterproofing installed before you put in a green roof. The green roof is not a replacement for a waterproofing. Um, it goes on top of the waterproofing. So if you need your waterproofing replaced, you can't just 
install a green roof. I think a lot of time people think it's sort of an integrated system, which I understand why they would think that. Um, but you have to put the waterproofing down first. And what are some of the benefits of having a green roof, particularly in a city? There's so many benefits. So green roofs reduce air pollution significantly. They reduce combined sewage overflow, which is what happens when it rains every single time it rains in New York City. Um, and uh, it also creates natural habitat for migratory birds, overwintering birds, pollinators. Um, it, vital habitat that these insects um, and birds require to survive. Uh, creates open, beautiful space for people to admire and interact with. It reduces energy consumption for the building. And that's just so, from cooling the building, so that the well, need, or how does it how It's does it reducing, work? during the winter it also provides insulation. insulation but yeah, if the majority of the energy savings does take place mm -hmm. during the summer, because plants are not only providing insulation and the soil is not only providing insulation, during the summer the plants are evapotranspiring, cooling the air, creating a microclimate, creating shade for the actual roof membrane. So it's significant. Mm. Um, also, lots of other benefits for green roofs. They can create jobs, create internships, educational opportunities. I think that's really important. Um, it's, it's just absolutely fascinating because you're, you're talking about a whole ecosystem, not just on the roof, but yeah. kind of affecting the kind of ecosystem of the community. And, um, and you mentioned before that you like to work with native plants that you're really inspired by, but what are the benefits of native plant species? I could talk a lot about the co-benefits or the way they affect other species, and I think that's mostly how people perceive benefits. But I think we also need to consider the benefits of preserving species in itself, plants in itself, mm -hmm. not just sort of as a backdrop for other um, species, which are crucial, obviously, and right now we're in the middle of a potentially catastrophic insect um, extinction. Uh, we really need to be talking about that more as a society. And by creating natural habitat, we're not just planting pretty plants. We're reestablishing these connections that desperately need to be connected, not just for their sake, for our sake, for mm -hmm. so many reasons, mm -hmm. so many <laughs> reasons that these conversations between insects and plants need to continue and have to happen. So I believe that this is something really crucial and that keeping these plants alive and present in our lives is also crucial. This is part of our, our history, our geographical history, um, and it, it's part of who we are. So not everybody could have a green roof, but what are some things that citizens can do in order to be able to get pollinators in their sure. neighborhood? Right. I mean, even people renting apartments, which most New Yorkers do, you can put uh, native plants on your fire escape. You can have a window box you, if you have access to a backyard or a front yard or even a tree pit. You can plant native plants. Um, or in my case, a community garden, I guess. Or a community garden. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of people are doing that, and that's, that's wonderful. That's a great space to plant in. Um, and so that's one thing you can do to create habitat for pollinators and just increase biodiversity and plants beautiful, unique plants. And gardening is very therapeutic, even if it's in a teeny space. I had a fire escape forest, is what I called it, <laughs> for years, which may be illegal, according to the Department of Buildings, just to put that warning out there. It definitely is, but I think a okay. lot of people get away with it. Yes, <laughs> definitely, okay. Yeah, well, thank you so much. This is really great, and I'm really looking forward to kind of getting outdoors and seeing what's blooming. Sure, sounds good. One of the things that I, I'm always fascinated by is growing medium and substrate, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about this substrate and what's yeah. common for green roofs. So this is uh, 80 to 90 percent inorganic matter, um, ex expanded shale. Uh, so that's just shale that's been put in a huge kiln um, that is very, very hot maybe 2,000 degrees Celsius, so hot that the shale just expands 
Um, and, and probably we, comes a little lightweight or? Yes, and it becomes lighter weight and it also becomes hydrophilic to some extent. Mm -hmm. So it, it's able to absorb some amount of water and retain some amount of water. And it's lighter and that's one of the, that's the main reason it's used. It's also excellent drainage. So a lot of the water drain, all the water just drains very easily. So there's no sitting water and that also reduces the weight and also allows for a lot of air circulation within the root system. So that helps for growing um, and it helps the roots to prosper. And how thick is this substrate? Okay, so we have um, two inches of drainage medium and that's essentially the same as the growing medium except that it doesn't have any organic matter. Mm -hmm. So it's lighter mm -hmm. and it's just drainage. So the only purpose it serves is for draining. But the roots can grow in it as well. So that's why I chose to use two inches of drainage media as opposed to drainage board, which is more typical in the green roof industry because it's a lot easier to deal with. You don't have to have super sacks of drainage, you know, craned up to the roof. You just put down this flat recycled plastic board. Um, but we didn't do that because we want the plants to succeed in the long term here. Um, so we've got two inches of drainage, then we have a filter fabric, and then we have six inches of growing medium. Wow. Which is what you see here. And then what is the weight for every square foot of this growing medium? Okay. So it's under 50 pounds per square foot, fully okay. saturated, which, fully may, saturated. which may surprise people. Yeah. Um, it's much lighter than what you think. Um, so the green roof technology has really evolved uh, in the last few years and soil mediums have become a lot lighter um, and that's really enabled a lot more projects. So it's good for people to know. And can we just go through some of the species that we see sure. here? Maybe you could yeah. kind of point them out because I know like a lot of the plant nerds will like yeah. love to see, you know, what are native species here. So you have Penstemon digitalis, which is in bloom right now. It's a fairly small native plant. Uh, most of the plants we chose are drought tolerant, but we do have irrigation here. We have drip line irrigation, which we haven't used very much recently because it's been raining so much. Uh, we have wild strawberry, Fregraea virginiana. Yeah, they are just growing everywhere, huh? Yes, they are. Do you collect them and eat them? Uh, no, I don't. No, yeah, leave them for the birds. And also, there's a lot of air pollution here, and I, yeah. I just don't really want to eat stuff growing up here. Yeah. Growing stuff in the belly of the beast, you get some of that beastly, beastly pollution. Uh, we have wild columbine, Azizia aptera which is just ending, um, was flowering. Really lovely, underused plant, um, bright yellow. Here's one that's still in flower. The Asclepias tuberosa, uh, it's a milkweed, is about to bloom, it's in bud. So that's a bright orange. Um, we have Echinacea tennesseensis, um, which is not shot up yet, but it's got its little basil leaves there. Uh, we have a lot of the prairie drop seed. Um, we have solidago, uh, that's goldenrod. Um, we have, what else here? We have a lot of these teeny little native succulents, oh, yeah. which Look are right here. not very well known. Um, they're called Femoranthus calicinium. Is this what I'm looking at right yes. here? Yes. Wow, they're so cute. Calicinium. What is this one right here? Um, this is a native bulb, Quamash, Camasia Quamash. Wow, that's really beautiful. Yeah, it is. It's a wonderful, wonderful choice for a rooftop. It's not terribly drought tolerant, but it's always done well on all the roofs I put in it, so I just keep on doing it. And then I noticed you have this like pebble little riverbed. We wanted to demonstrate what a miniature rain garden can look like. So when it rains, the water comes out at the base here and the water flows through here um, just like a little mini rain garden. Uh, obviously we're mitigating a lot of storm water here with the green roof but again it's just an educational example. And we have weeds up here that we need to pull. And so not native I'm weeds. assuming that sometimes a bird will come here and... So we have Phragmites. Oh um, yes, common reed. Yeah, yeah. and that uh, 
is a bit dangerous just because it moves so quickly. Do you have the invasive haplotype, do you know? Or do you I have the... I don't know. I don't know. I thought it was uh, all invasive. No, there is a common read of Phragmites here that is native, and then there came a, an invasive haplotype that came down the St. Lawrence Seaway. And it is the same species, but the haplotype is different. And it actually exists longer throughout the season, acts like an invasive, even though it is the same species, which is super right. fascinating. That and is, yeah. The only reason why I know that is because I did a GIS research project in college on the haplotype. We looked at the spread through um, road and road type because yeah. it was actually spreading through a lot of landfill waste and everything along right. those lights. But it, it did make its way down the St. Lawrence Seaway through the Aquasasani River Delta and probably made its way to here as we all. Well, should. it's all on Newtown Creek. So we're right next to Newtown Creek. Yeah. And it spread, however, through a bird or just seed. And its roots are quite impressive. So we do try to keep on top of that. So maintaining any space where there are a lot of invasives um, everywhere, yeah. which there are everywhere, um, requires time and we're lucky that we have some funding still. Mm -hmm. But that's why I came up with this idea to do cut flowers is because we need to maintain the roof. Yeah. Uh, and we need to be able to pay for that. Mm. And how about this? This is like phenomenal. I'm not familiar with this one. Uh, salvia lirata. That's a oh. native salvia. Oh, what? Right. So it's a, it's a mint. Yeah, I could see it has a square yep. stem. Yep, it's a square nice. stem. Good job. And then uh, this one? Chrysogonum virginianum. Um, that can tolerate some shade, too. Uh, it's a, just a wonderful native ground cover. I use it a lot. I love the pop of color from the salvia. There are some native plants that I mean, native to the Northeast that feel tropical. Yeah. I mean, when you look at sumacs, yeah, they're really sure. uh, exotic looking. For sure. I love seeing them planted in Europe, that like these amazing that. specimens, you know, in people's yeah. front yards. Oh, no, I know. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. Wonderful. Look, it's not going to survive. It's being grown over, but we have some Opuntia homifusa. Oh, look. Sorry, got so excited. That's great. Probably oh yeah, like look at the strawberries. Busted the microphone with my excitement. Oh my goodness. I said I wouldn't eat them, but it's looking really tempting. So funny. So these are small, but full of flavor. They're uh, packed with antioxidants, much more so than the cultivated versions. Oh, I would imagine versions. so. I, never, yeah. I hadn't thought about that, but that's yeah. also something we want to do at the farm. Yeah. Well, I love this and I love the little- The talinum is, or that's its old name, the femoranthus is got quite a bright magenta flower at the end of the season. And then this is all sedum down it, below. It's 90% sedum. Yeah. We do have some other plants in it, some weeds I'm seeing. It's a, there's something very zen about it though, you know? Yeah, it's like a moss garden. It's very much like a moss garden. Gosh, it's so crazy to look out at all of this. Isn't this amazing? Know, it's, just... it's really mind blowing. Well, you know, it's so funny because I think when we think of like landscape design, like traditionally, especially cause like, you know, landscape architects or whatever, you think about building on the ground, but here you are kind of a landscape architect in a way in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, it, um, it is a great place to design because it's a very unique experience mm. to be able to enjoy nature, if that's what you can call it, but in this elevated level where you're mixed with all these other higher elevations, like you're in the sky, mm. um, which is unusual, especially in the city. So it's, it is an exciting place to be. And you got to work with what you have. I mean, I know you said that this is not the main portion of your business, even though this was like the whole reason why you wanted to start and doing green roofs. But, yeah. um, you know, not all of us have backyards or landscapes to work with, but right. there is a tremendous amount of green space up here. And you said this is what? Is it, yeah, 22,000. 22,000. Okay, yeah. geez. I mean, it's hard to get square footage. It's yeah. Like 10,000 square feet right yeah. there or, or a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> when you're faced with the chore of having to weed it, then you realize how big it is. And then how, how does the planting happen? Is it by seed? Can you just like spread it <laughs> do or do, are you actually doing like, you know, plugs or 
you know, actual like large plants already? We did most leaf plugs okay. um, for the intensive native plant roofs. And then we use sedum mats for that area. Okay. So pre-grown on a nursery, shipped um, in a truck in ro huge rolls. Hmm. Um, Almost like the grass that they roll up and you can roll down. It looks exactly like, um, you know, turf. It's just the right. same situation. So you had mentioned that you, a lot of the stuff up here that you planted in plugs, but you had mentioned that you wanted to plant really close together mm -hmm. to stop any kind of weed seeds from coming in. Yeah. So do you space your plugs or do you kind of put them all together and then s and take them out afterwards? Uh, well, I haven't had to take any out yet. Um, some of the seeds uh, I, we sowed too densely, mm -hmm. so we, we have had to take out a few of those. But yeah, I'd rather go too dense mm -hmm. than um, have a huge weed colonization on my hands, infestation. Uh, so that's definitely been the technique, dense, um, you know, reduce space. It also gives you a lot more pleasure right in the beginning because you're like, oh, yeah, all of a yeah. sudden it's, it's like from gray, gray to green. Yeah, yeah. Well, nature abhors a, a void yeah. space. Yeah. So we try to fill it up or else it will. Yeah. So we try to make the decision for it. Indeed. Well, should we go upstairs and check that out? Yes, we should. Okay. Oh, yeah, look at this. It's blooming compared, again, yes. I... I have such a different view of it from the last time I saw it. Wow, look at all the penstemon over here. It's really wow. great, yeah. So these are some of the annuals that we've planted. You see that they're coming up right now? Yeah. The retibita. That's an annual native that... Now you have to plant it every year, usually. Well, yeah, that's what is the concept. Yeah. But it seeds itself around and it always comes back. Right. And, and it, it is great and I certainly don't mind it. The point is, is that it fills in space while the other perennials, which are larger and slower growing, fill in. And it also means that its seeds are just kind of in the seed bank of the soil. So every time we pull up a weed or something gets disturbed, it's there. It's yeah. what's coming up, not another uninvited plant. Yeah. So you see, something. we have three months to go, really, yeah. until everything reaches its potential height. So this is really low growing season. Hey guys, so I hope you really enjoyed that episode. It is absolutely beautiful here at Kingsland Wildflowers, even against this crazy New York City backdrop. And of course, if you like these episodes, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And you can also hit the notifications bell if you wanna be notified when the next episode launches. And you can follow along on my journey at homesteadbrooklyn.com and on Instagram at homesteadbrooklyn. See you next week.